This episode is sponsored once again by postgraduate study at the Religious Studies Department at the University of Edinburgh. The top master's course and the research PhD are very well respected and Chris and I can both vouch for that, having both done it ourselves. So for more information on postgraduate study here at the School of Divinity in the University of Edinburgh, click the link in the description of the post. But for now, let's get on with the episode. Hey Chris, welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. Hi David, thank you for your welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. And welcome to you, the listener out there in internet land. Uh, today we've got a new interviewer for you, it's Ella Bach, is over there on the other side of the Atlantic Ooh. in the US of A, um, who interviewed some people who are over here on this side of the Atlantic. She spoke to Theo Wildcroft and Steve Jacobs about Hindu traditions in contemporary British communities. Yeah, very interesting interview looking at contemporary uses, people might say appropriations, I wouldn't, sounds a bit colonial, of Hindu traditions in contemporary groups, the Art of Living Foundation and in yoga practice communities. So let's pass over to Ella, Stephen and Theo. I guess I can introduce myself to you, first of all, in person. I'm Ella. I go to school in, at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, but I'm currently at home for the summer in Washington, D.C. Okay, well, I'm Steve Jacobs, or Stephen Jacobs, if you're being very formal, senior lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton here in the UK, mostly based in the media department, but also uh, based in religious studies as well. And I'm Theo Wildcroft. Nobody calls me Theodora unless they really want to make me giggle. I'm at the OU, the Open University in Milton Keynes, but I'm actually at home in Wiltshire at the moment, in North Wiltshire, in the South Country. And I am just coming up on my last year of the PhD. So I guess we can jump right into it. My first question, I guess, is to just get started with introducing what Yoga Raves and Kirtan are. So if you could like explain a little bit what those are and their presence in Britain and if they interact at all and how they would do that. Well, I think for a while now, there's there's been a, a kind of a subcurrent of Kirtan influence in the UK, but it, it's it's not particularly well known. So I think we start we start I think with Kirtan because Kirtan is an existing practice within South Asia, which is a, a practice of devotion or religious practice through sound and specifically through staring singing and music, and that has uh, an interesting history, which I think we'll, we'll go into in more detail in terms of how that has met and interacted with subcultural elements within within British culture in the last 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, I think. And the most recent kind of incarnations of that are doing something, are doing some interesting things, really, that, that aren't particularly well known, but are kind of interesting in what they're doing. Yoga Raves, I think, is, a, is really much more recent. Yeah, I mean, yoga raves is a term that's used by a duo who come from this group called the Art of Living Foundation, who are, a, well, to cut a very long story short, are a kind of Hindu-derived meditation movement. They're a very close cousin to transcendental meditation. And, you know, one of the things with Art of Living is they wanted to draw in a younger audience. And so these two musicians who were members of the group, started what they called yoga rave dance parties, which was a kind of alcohol, drug-free events that had the same sort of format as a, as a kind of rave would have, but using traditional kind of Hindu mantras, to use a loaded term, or bhajans, as the soundtrack, but giving it a Western soundtrack and particularly an electronic dance music beat. So it's a kind of interesting kind of syncretic phenomenon. So we've got the kind of yoga raves going on, I think mostly in mostly in London. Yoga rave isn't a term that's used by the, the UK group. They prefer the term yoga jam. So there's a whole range yeah. of different terminology. I've seen mantra punk, uh, yoga rave, yoga jam. And it's based very much about a, a small group within Art of Living here in the UK. They, they said to me, we, we do not like the term rave because in the UK, rave is, is so much mixed with the, the culture of electronic dance music. And part of that is taking lots of MDMA or, or ecstasy, as it's more commonly known. So jam, they preferred this terminology. The leader of the group said, oh, I like the term. It's cool, he said. And it kind of has this connotations of the bricolage 
and also uh, something that's fun, enjoyable. There is a, a wider movement as well, though, for conscious clubbing, which I'm aware of as well. I have friends from the yoga community who, particularly around London, I think Brighton, maybe places like that, that do other kind of conscious clubbing events, which are specifically alcohol and drug free. And, you know, kind of often the early Sunday morning seems to be a big time for them. The music they're using is very much rave music, but it has that similar sense of wanting to achieve a state of ecstatic commun- communion, kind of a coming together kind of a feeling and a celebration, but without the, the stimulants, without the artificial stimulants. So there's kind of a crossover there. And then, of course, they're all often using contemporary curtain music and contemporary curtain tunes, which provides another link as well through, I think. Curtain is much more a practice that's done live. I think that's one of the big differences for me is that one of the things that's clear with Kirtan is it is always live musicians, live singers, live interaction with the audience, the music happening in real time. One of the things uh, that the, you know talked about over the years that we've been interested in this is the difference between participation and mm. just uh, being a part of the audience. There's a whole kind of array of different relationships to participation. So the traditional kirtan is, of course, a call and response that very much involves everybody, whereas sometimes the yoga jams and the yoga raves, or they're much more performances in many ways. Well, I'm interested in how the two different like movements and communities are trying to reconcile traditional cultures and practices with contemporary, modern, like, having yoga and therapeutic things in raves and EDM music and how you see them reconciling those two. And if it is, they are authentic ways of practicing and like what authenticity means, you know, here, because that's a loaded term. Authenticity (laughs) is a really interesting uh, phenomenon. And just being reading a book of about authenticity by Lindholm and he says really when we're thinking about authenticity you see two different types of discourses around authenticity one is he calls the historical and genealogical and the other he calls and now I can't remember the term he uses uh, romantic and expressive really interesting for me is that when you look at discourses about yoga rave and yoga jam in art of living and indeed their wider ex- practices is they use both of those discourses mm. so it's authentic because it's Vedic and of course if you know anything about the Vedas sound is very primordial you know with the primordial mantra on in fact the notion of sound within the Hindu tradition is badly understudied it's not studied it's not given the centrality by many people the way that Mm. it does so it's got that roots in the Vedic or a kind of invented or romanticized Vedic past but it also is part of the therapeutic culture where it's the experience that the experience without the roots becomes kind of too ambiguous and free-floating so you experience it a somatic experience But that somatic experience is then rooted back into an imagined Vedic past. I would add a third aspect, the notion of authenticity that comes from a personal way to practice and Mm -hmm. a personal investment into the practice. That that what the the Kirtan Wallace, the musicians, people who share Kirtan are bringing is a level of experience with that practice. They're often quite accomplished musicians, although they're not necessarily prized or technical ability so much as a sheer devotion to the practice itself that they spend you know large amounts of time doing what they do which is singing singing and playing not just for audiences but for themselves and that also tangentially has a, a communal aspect which one of the things i find really interesting is that when you have big bhakti events big kirtan events where you have a, you have a number of different kirtan musicians playing one after another they will back each other up so if someone arrives early or someone's around, you know, or, or one will say to another, could you play shaker on this for me? Would you be, I'd love to play tabla on yours. And so you get, you get these individual musicians or small groups of musicians, but actually when they play at these events, they have all sorts of friends playing with them. It was them and friends. And their friends are usually people who are, have either just played or are going to play again. So there's this, this idea that the most joyous thing that they could be doing is playing 
always. So there's an authenticity there that comes from that weight of practice and that weight of personal history rather than necessarily genealogy. And certainly one of the historical aspects that I'm aware of with regards to Kirtan here out in the Southwest in particular is that we have a certain community of people who spent a lot of time in Indian ashrams and loved the experience of Kirtan there and began to practice Kirtan there. And they're over here, they're home again, and they miss that community coming together. And a lot of these events are about them coming together with other people, regardless of whether they were at the same ashram, regardless of whether they're the same lineage, regardless of even if they have the same devotional roots, even, you know, you have people from different different sects and lineages coming together, people with no lineage at all coming together, that what they value is that communal coming together and singing and sharing kirtan which is really interesting. So there's that communal weight as well, so that over time, the community has its own history. So it's really interesting when you talk about authenticity with regard to Hindu roots and South Asian roots, which are obviously very real and very true. But I would say is what I see is I see a weight of practice in this country that's been going on for decades. And that's the roots as much as anything else that they are connecting to. I mean, there is a romanticisation of Hindu traditions. And, you know, Thea and I mm-hmm. talked about it. it goes right back to countercultural roots here in the UK. Of course, George Harrison, uh, 1969, uh, the Maha Mantra by the Krishna consciousness got mm-hmm. to number 12 in the top of the pop, sold 700,000. In America, you've got um, the countercultural movements, particularly people like Ginsburg and the Mantra Rock Dance uh, in San Francisco that had some of the foremost countercultural groups, people like Moby Great. Well, have actually been going on long before the counterculture, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I think, the counterculture, I think, I think, is a very important threshold. But I think it's a threshold for visibility. Um, it's that we have these periodic visible manifestations of commercial culture engaging with with Hindu devotional music. But what is important to remember is those do not feed necessarily directly from ancient Indian practices. They feed from an existing subculture that is continually engaging with this music and continually engaging with this practice. You know, there's a transnational culture. Certainly in the UK, spends time. A lot of them will spend time, you know, be going backwards and forwards between India and the UK. So uh, a number of the people involved will be of South Asian heritage. A number of people won't. It's a whole transnational current that's going on that's always there. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month by going to patreon.com slash projectsrs and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people on their learning. So if you can help either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated. It will help us keep bringing this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. I was wondering if you've seen come across any backlash against the use of mantras in Western pop culture or even within the Kirtan and yoga, rave, yoga jam communities. I can speak to one really interesting discussion of this um, by an integral yoga teacher of Japa. So it's so a mantra teacher. So she leading a session at an event I was at that wasn't even really kirtan. It was very much on mantra and the effect of mantra and the effect of sound. So the effect of mantra on uh, the energetic field, the effect of mantra on, you know, our, our connection to the universe. And she talked specifically about the, about the Gayatri Mantra. So she connected it to this lineage that it's been chanted continuously in India for a thousand years, or, you know, whatever the, however the story goes. But these days, she said, you know, a lot of people come across the Gayatri Mantra through, she didn't mention the share version, but she mentioned, you know, various kind of pop culture versions of it. And she said, in her view, that is absolutely fine because it's a way in. So it's a way in. People will come across these pop culture versions of mantra, and it is not the same. It does not have the same effect as a mantra that's been chanted in community for for devotional intent. But the words still have power, and the sound still has power. And it is a it is a connection that can a seed, if you like, that is planted that can lead people to something deeper and fuller. 
I'm aware that in the States in particular, there's a very, very different debate that's going on, I think, around the issues of authenticity and appropriation. And I think it's important to be aware that the discussions of appropriation are very different here in Europe and particularly in the UK. Our yoga culture as a whole is less commercialized. It's still, you know, it's still commercialized in many respects, but we still we have an enormous grassroots uh, yoga community still. And that yoga community is still more, much more integrated with South Asian groups and communities and influences. So as a result, the conversations are more complicated. That's not to say that appropriation isn't an issue and it's and it's not talked about. But it's much less polarizing than debates have been recently, I think, in the States. Would you I think, think the agree? discussions about appropriation really only occur in the academic arena, mm-hmm. because when we're talking broadly about the Hindu traditions, and I'll use the plural here, there's no this idea that, you know, OK, so you have a murti and it's in, installed in a temple, but anybody can go and buy image of the Ganesh or anything and, and they're not so precious about different uses of it. You've got, of course, the tradition of calendar art and the more visual things. And and also, you know, when you think about Kirtan in, in India itself, you know, a lot of uh, Hindus are chanting Kirtan to Bollywood tunes. So yeah. you already have that tradition of taking a traditional kirtan that goes right back to kind of medieval Bhakti period, but it's being chanted to the latest Bollywood tunes. Yeah. So it doesn't, yeah. and even in India, you know, you get CDs like uh, Cosmic Trance for Youth. Within the Hindu community itself, young people are taking the traditional mantras and, and bhajans and giving it their own electronic dance soundtrack to try and draw young Hindus in India into it. Devotional music in India is one of the biggest selling kind of genres of music. You go anywhere like Rishikesh, which is a very important pilgrimage place, and you, you've literally got, you know, stall upon stall along the, in the bazaar along the banks of the Ganges that are selling all of these kind of remixed mantras, if you like. I also love the supposedly traditional instruments of Kirtan that are now accepted to be, the, you know, the ones that everyone should have, tablet and harmonium. And that's fascinating when you think the only reason that harmoniums ever came to India, as far as I'm aware, is through Christian missionaries. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, if you want a good harmonium, you, you go to an Indian manufacturer, <laughs> you don't go anywhere else. One of the few places in the world that still has huge amounts of harmoniums being played is, is India. And you have curtain that doesn't have harmonium and tabla, that's now seen as non-traditional. And I mean, I was at an event the other week and I realized uh, it was a, it was a Bhakti event and I realized tucked away in the corners around, around Around the space were eight different harmoniums so we're waiting for those particular musicians to come so I counted eight one day in there I mean I think cultural borrowing is really interesting and all religious scholars scholars hopefully are aware of how syncretic religion is generally I think there are there are further discussions you can have about power and about colonialism but I think those differences are much clearer when you're talking about multi-million dollar selling pop artists than if you're talking about Kirtan musicians in Bristol or whatever who you have a day job and sell a few CDs. You know, I mean, the level of power they, that they have to appropriate somebody else's culture is, is, is very different. What's more interesting to me is the syncretism involved in the music itself. And I, I don't know how much that's true of the yoga jam side of things, but the Kirtan movement in the Southwest singers are using not just Vedic and Hindu mantras, but they're using Buddhist mantras, they're using Sikh mantras, they're using Sufi mantras, they're using all sorts of different things and bringing them together as Kirtan under the label of Kirtan. Certainly within Art of Living satsangs, you know, you certainly do have occasionally, but it's very, very occasionally do they songs or, or poems from outside. I've heard Imagine done once in a kirtan, but they tend to stick to their kind of favourite that tend to come from, the you know, the Sanskrit and the Bhakti traditions. Well, I wouldn't call it a songbook exactly, but they do have a list and, and you flick through and yes, there's poems by Rumi and Eluya chorus and but they very rarely yeah. use them, interestingly enough. That, that is interesting. Well, I see a lot more use of 
for that. I mean, one of the classic examples, which I personally adore, actually, is a, a chap called Tim Chalice uh, down kind of Bath and Bristol Way. He has a chant uh, which takes a feast poem, I think, which is this place. So this place where you are, God circled on a map for you, wherever your eyes and ears and heart can move against the earth and sky, the beloved has bowed there waiting which is rather beautiful, but he takes that and he sings that and then he takes it immediately into a Hare Krishna. Um, so we see that as well. We see, you know, taking two di- essentially two different traditions and bringing them together in those chants. And the sense within this community in particular is that it does not matter. The shape of your belief does not matter. The deity that you are calling to does not matter. The, the, you know, these places often have these enormous long altars filled with any number of different murtis, any number of different images of different gurus, you know, any any deity or, or, or anything else that, that is considered to be sacred can go on there. The point is, is that you come together and you sing. And that's it. There's the idea of devotion without prescribing the object of devotion. I mean, there are other artists. I mean, we talked about Sheila Chandra, who's uh, yeah. British South Asian and, you know, coming from a Hindu background and then bringing in, you know, English folk music. So you start off with Om Namah Shivaya and then suddenly morphs into some sort of English folk song. I mean, that's kind yeah. of interesting as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from a different, different side. I think there's, I think there's some really, really beautiful alliances and, and kind of borrowings that are going on and it is interesting again to go back to the idea of what makes them what makes them authentic what makes them effective and I think it is a, a depth of understanding of the music that they're working with and the practices that they're working with. When you talk to to the Yoga Jam crew they, they talk about the Vedic origin and, and what Guy Beck calls the sonic theology which goes yeah. back right to the Afarva Veda is the experience but it's also validated through a kind of quasi-scientific discourse around the physics of vibration which yeah. are, you know that, that if you chant the mantras you do not need to know I mean of course style talks about you know it's, it's the sound not the semantics that's important that this is all to do with the science of vibration so it's kind of validated through tracing it back to a romanticized Vedic past, the the somatic experience of chanting it, which is again mm. validated through this kind of scientific, quasi-scientific discourse around vibrations. Yes, and that it will eventually change the world. Just keep chanting the Gayatri Mantra. Just keep chanting it and, and all will be well. We're about out of time for the podcast length. I've enjoyed listening to both of you talk and thank you so much for talking to me and RSP about everything you know. Well, thank you for facilitating this. Mm, Indeed, indeed. Fantastic to hear that interview. Great to get a new interviewer on the team and great to hear um, from Steve and Theo, um, our BASR colleagues. Didn't see Steve at the BASR this year, but uh, Theo was was there contributing away. So, And has just had a new tattoo as well, I believe, with Alison Robertson <laughs> Indeed, to, to yeah. celebrate the publication. We're, we're making there. a little film about that for the Open University's <laughs> yeah. blog, so you know, you'll see that soon. Over the summer, in case you missed it, you should know that the Religious Studies Project is now co-sponsoring um, Implicit Religion, the Equinox Journal. I'm one of the co-editors, and along with Jack Lachlan from the University of Sudbury in Canada, and my colleague Chris is, of course, on the editorial board. And during the summer, we featured a special edition on religion and nationalism, guest edited by our very own Liam T. Sutherland, uh, it, with an article and an extensive introduction by himself, and also featuring an article from RSP contributor Damon Lykarunos. So do look out for that. It's available through, you know, through Equinox's site. Uh, well worth a read. And our Religious Studies Project subscribers do get a discount to um, Implicit Religion, so um, check that out on our site. I'm not sure where we last posted that, but just um, search for Implicit Religion. We'll on the try website. and remember and repost that, but yes, it'll come up if you if you search Implicit Religion. Next week, we've got another interview by my esteemed colleague across the table. Um, David's been speaking with Arco Longcomer and Bjorn Latafjord um, on the topic of what do we mean by indigenous religion, brackets S. 
close brackets, question mark. What do we mean by indigenous religions? This follows on nicely from an interview that you did with Bjorn about the category of indigenous religions a few years ago. And then um, Jim Cox uh, responded to that with uh, a written piece. And so it, it builds quite nicely on that. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting discussion. It builds on that work. And we, we look at a range of different ways in which indigeneity is conceptualized or referred to in political, religious social contexts uh, very very interesting and great to finally have Arco on the podcast which I don't think we ever managed to we haven't and he is indeed a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh who as he heard sponsored this podcast so that's pretty fantastic I think that's enough news for this week we need to we need to parcel it out ration it out through the coming remaining 15 weeks leading up to our Christmas special for this year hint, hint. and I think we're actually in the privileged position of we're basically everything is done we're now. done up we're till just, Christmas yeah, yeah kicking back now yeah just both just going to be sipping mimosas by the fire which yeah. doesn't really that metaphor just that's not even a metaphor first of all it's only start of semester and obviously we're both relatively tired and that doesn't bode well it doesn't bode well but you can tell that we still have some energy and enthusiasm left at this point in about four or five weeks it'll be a different hello it's religious studies project again so you know watch out for listening to our slow degradation over the our, our inevitable decline over the coming 15 weeks and on that note thanks, thanks for, for listening, listening. The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. Brought to you by Founders and Editors-in-Chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and Managing Editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett, and our opportunities digest by Yana Shirley. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio assistance from Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. Don't forget you can support the project using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or by donating at patreon.com backslash project rs and you can find us on facebook twitter google plus youtube itunes and other portals